Good afternoon. Most of you know I'm Bill Dessler. I'm president of RIT. So welcome to the Saunders College of Business Gasser Lecture Series during RIT's Brick City Homecoming and Family Weekend. And you know, I just got an announcement I thought was relevant to this, given that uh, Ben & Jerry's is such a wonderful example of a responsible startup. LinkedIn just published a college ranking of, uh, curiously enough, uh, the schools that uh, most successfully place software developers in startup businesses. And RIT came out 13th. That's after among about 5,000 international universities. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> and believe me, the company we're in is, is uh, pretty distinguished stuff. So I, I think this is a very appropriate lecture for us. Let me tell you a little bit about the Gasser Lecture Series. It's always hosted by the Saunders College of Business as a continuing forum for distinguished members of the business and education community. And it's made possible by a gift from the late John Wiley Jones, a former honorary member of the RIT Board of Trustees and founder of Jones Chemicals Incorporated in memory of William D. Gasser. Gasser actually taught accounting at RIT from 1967 until his death in 1977. He was a member of the Board of Directors of Jones Chemicals and a partner in charge of the Rochester Office of Haskins and Sells. But now, let me introduce this year's speaker. He joins us from Vermont, where he has been an entrepreneur creating a very successful business. Maybe you've heard about it. Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> By the way, I'm an avid consumer of his product. <laughs> Co-founder of Ben & Jerry's Homemade Incorporated, Jerry Greenfield has helped to build a storefront venture into a $300 million ice cream empire by making social responsibility and creative management strengths instead of weaknesses. He is going to talk to us today about his entrepreneurial spirit together with what he feels is our common social responsibility and maybe a little bit about his radical business philosophy as well. There's going to be an opportunity at the end of his talk for a brief question and answer session. And afterwards, please head down to the Saunders College of Business for free ice cream and book signing with Jerry himself. So without further ado, please join me in welcome Mr. Jerry Greenfield. Hello, nice to see you all. Uh, to take care of the suspense about the flavors after my talk, <laughs> there will be chocolate chip cookie dough, cherry Garcia, and chocolate therapy. I, I didn't pick the flavors, and uh, if you don't like or are allergic to chocolate, you're really in trouble. <laughs> well, I am tremendously excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I have been having a wonderful time here at RIT, and uh, I could not be more thrilled to be here today. Family weekend. It's families, right? I love family weekend. Uh, I am going to talk about Ben & Jerry's, how the company started, how we have tried to operate the company. You may notice that Ben is not here, so I'll be able to tell some really good stories about Ben. <laughs> uh, the other thing that's helpful to keep in mind is that Ben & Jerry's is no longer an independent company. It got bought, oh, about 14 years ago. Uh, by this larger conglomerate called Unilever. Unilever has brands like, oh, Ragu Spaghetti Sauce, Lipton Tea, Dove Soap. They have a very good sense of humor. On the same day they bought Ben & Jerry's, they also bought SlimFast. <laughs> uh, and 
selling the company was not something we wanted to do. Uh, we wanted to stay independent, but Ben & Jerry's was a public company at that time, uh, which meant that anybody could purchase shares of the company, and Unilever offered so much money that our board was not able to find an alternative for the shareholders. So Ben and I both still work at the company. We're employees. We're not involved in management or operations. We have jobs with no responsibility <laughs> and no authority. Uh, for those of you in careers, this is really something to shoot for over 35 years. Uh, so, uh, you know, no, <laughs> we're not in operations, we're not in management. What do we do, really? Um, here I am, what can I say? Uh, all right, well, so, Ben and I are old friends from junior high school. We met in seventh grade, we were 13 years old. We met in gym class because we were the two slowest, fattest kids in the class. <laughs> and we were running around the track, there was a pack of kids up in the front, there was Ben and me in the back. The coach was yelling at us, gentlemen, you've got to run the mile in under seven minutes. If you don't, you're going to have to do it again. And Ben would yell back at the coach, gee, coach, if I don't do it in under seven minutes the first time, I'm certainly not going to do it in under seven <laughs> minutes the second time. And that was when I realized that Ben was somebody I wanted to get to know. We went through junior high school and high school together. After high school, Ben did not want to go to college, but his parents wanted him to go. His father and his sister filled out his applications for him. He ended up choosing Colgate, not too far from here, in upstate New York, because the brochures said they had fireplaces in the dorm rooms. And <laughs> ben thought that was really cool. So he went there for a year and a half, and he dropped out of school. Uh, he then went back to Skidmore College for a little while, and he dropped out of there. He went back to NYU for a while. He dropped out of there. And then Ben signed up with uh, this really progressive college program called University Without Walls. So at University Without Walls, you don't have to go to class because the world is your campus, and you don't have to take tests you get credit simply for learning. And Ben dropped out of there too. Uh, <laughs> still a little too much structure for Ben. Uh, and he worked a series of jobs. Ben was a taxi cab driver in New York City. He was a short order cook. He was a pottery wheel deliverer. He was a night mopper. He was a baker's helper. Uh, this was in a period of two or three years. So he was not on the career path. I, on the other hand, went to college. I did four years straight. I was pre-med. I applied to about 20 medical schools. I was rejected from 20 medical schools. That's yeah, pretty impressive, right? Uh, I got a job as a lab technician in a biochemistry research lab so that I could fortify my resume. And I reapplied to medical school I was rejected from medical school again, and I got another job as a lab technician in a biochemistry research lab because I already had experience. So this is what Ben and I were doing. We were essentially failing at everything we were trying to do, and we thought, well, why don't we try to get together, do something fun, be our own bosses, and since we always liked to eat quite a bit, we thought we would do something with food. Uh, we just picked homemade ice cream, didn't know anything about it. We learned how to make ice cream from a $5 correspondence course from Penn State University. We were really broke at the time, so we split one course between us, $2.50 apiece. Uh, <laughs> have you guys ever taken a correspondence course? <laughs> so the way this worked was they send you a textbook in the mail, you read through the chapters, at the end of every chapter is a test. You're allowed to look back through the chapters, and then you answer the test, you mail it into your professor. They grade it, and they mail it back to you, and we got 100 on all our tests. Uh, 
we had finally found uh, <laughs> the type of education that was <laughs> suited to our unique learning styles. <laughs> so we figured we were ready to make ice cream. And then we thought, okay, where are we gonna open up? So uh, we wanted to live in a college town. We thought college kids eat a lot of ice cream. Didn't want to be in a big city, so we thought a rural college town. And then we thought, well, uh, if we're going to sell ice cream, it's probably good if it were warm. So we did this extensive research project, looking up all the colleges, uh, where they were located. We looked at the Atlas and the Almanac for the mean and medium temperatures. And we determined that all the warm rural college towns already had ice cream parlors. <laughs> So we, we discarded the idea of warm and picked Burlington, Vermont, a beautiful place, the home of the University of Vermont, and it was so cold all the time that there weren't any other ice cream parlors there, but we figured that would be okay because we thought we would be better off in a place with no competition since we had no idea what we were doing. And so we moved to Burlington, and then we needed to raise some money. Ben and I had each saved $4,000, so together we had $8,000. And we were gonna go into the local bank to try to borrow some money. And as we thought about it, we realized, boy, the local bank might not be that excited about lending money to Ben and Jerry. Uh, we had just moved to Vermont. We were young, we were 26 at the time. Uh, we didn't have any families, so we probably, didn't appear too stable. Uh, we didn't have any job experience. We didn't have any business experience. We didn't have any ice cream experience. Uh, we didn't have any assets. We didn't have any collateral. Uh, so we thought, well, if we're gonna borrow some money, we need to put together a really good business plan. Uh, we didn't know how to write a business plan, but we have a friend, Jeff Furman, who used to work for the Small Business Administration in New York City. Jeff got us a copy of a business plan that was from a pizza parlor in New York. So Ben and I essentially copied the business plan, <laughs> except every place where it said slice of pizza, we crossed it out <laughs> and we wrote in ice cream cone and we submitted it into the bank with a loan request for $18,000. The bank, in turn, resubmitted the proposal back to the Small Business Administration to see if they could get what was called an SBA guaranteed loan. If the SBA would guarantee the loan, the bank would be at no risk. So they sent this back to the SBA, and the SBA approved this loan again. Apparently, they really like this business plan. Uh, <laughs> uh, they approved it conditional upon us finding a location that they thought was suitable. So we looked all around Burlington. The place we fell in love with was this old abandoned gas station that was one block off the main street in town. It was right across the street from a park. But we couldn't get a long-term lease on the building. We could only get a one-year lease, and the SBA didn't think it was prudent to lend us money for seven years if we had a one-year lease, so we didn't get the money. Uh, we went back to the bank, they gave us $4,000 to go with our $8,000, so we had $12,000 to open up this shop when we thought we had needed $26,000. So not having all that money necessitated a few changes to the business plan. Uh, we bought all used equipment. The ice cream machine we bought was this used five-gallon rock salt and ice ice cream machine. You know, kind of like a home ice cream maker, only it made five gallons at a time, and it had a motor on it, so that was really good. Uh, we renovated the gas station ourselves using the cheapest material we could find, which was green rough-cut lumber. So we, we gave the ice cream shop a very rustic decor. Uh, I mean, the lumber was so green that when you hammered a nail into it, it would squirt back at you. Uh, but we got it together. We opened up in May of 1978. Uh, 
And as you all remember, it was a beautiful summer. We were making ice cream. We were scooping ice cream on a good day. Oh, we could make about 10 batches of ice cream. Then the winter came. It was minus 20 degrees outside. Sure enough, people stopped buying ice cream cones. Uh, we even came up with what I think was the best promotion in the history of Ben & Jerry's. It was called Popsid Bizwi, which stood for Penny Off Per Celsius Degree Below Zero Winter Extravaganza. <laughs> so the way this worked was when the temperature got below freezing, zero degrees Celsius, but 32 degrees Fahrenheit, we started taking money off the price of an ice cream cone, and the colder it got, the more money we took off the price of a cone. But not even that was enough to get people in the door. Uh, we got through the winter by selling ice cream to some of the local restaurants that had been asking for it. Uh, the next summer came, another beautiful summer, making ice cream, scooping ice cream. The winter came, couldn't figure out what to do. Uh, ben had an idea. Uh, you know, we, we always had all these salespeople that would stop into our shop, and they would sell us things like, oh, napkins and chocolate syrup. And, and Ben thought, boy, these salespeople have a great job. They drive around in their cars all day listening to music on these great sound systems. Then they stop into a store and they sell them something here or there, but then they get back into their car and they drive around and listen to music some more. Ben said this is what he wanted to do. So we made Ben our salesperson. Uh, he had this old station wagon, uh, <laughs> put a really nice sound system into it, and then we built an insulated styrofoam box back in the station wagon compartment. And in the morning, we would fill up this styrofoam box with tubs of ice cream, and then Ben would drive around Vermont as fast as he could, trying to sell the ice cream before it melted. So that got us through the next winter. Eventually, we started selling more ice cream that would fit in Ben's car. We bought this old ice cream delivery truck with about 250,000 miles on it. Uh, ben became our truck driver, put a really nice sound system into the truck. <laughs> Uh, and Ben was driving around Vermont, and the truck was breaking down all over the place, and it was costing us more money to repair the truck than we were making selling ice cream. Ben had another idea. He thought that if we could start packaging our ice cream into pint containers, that way he could sell it to all these little mom-and-pop grocery stores that he was driving by as he went from one restaurant to another. So we started doing that, and Ben got us, oh, 30 accounts in a month and a couple of hundred accounts after that. And, and that's how Ben and Jerry's stumbled into the ice cream manufacturing and distribution business. Uh, and we got a couple of other local distributors to start delivering Ben and Jerry's, one in upstate New York, one in New Hampshire. And then we got a big break. We got a couple of big ice cream distributors, one in Boston, one in Connecticut, to start carrying Ben and & Jerry's. And it was the first time we were gonna be selling ice cream into these major markets where we weren't the guys next door. So it was this big challenge. So right after these two distributors started carrying Ben & Jerry's, we got this urgent phone call from them one day. They said, listen, uh, we need to get together and talk. We can't do it over the phone. And it needs to be someplace really private. We said, okay, we decided to meet in a dark corner of a restaurant at Logan Airport in Boston. So we sat down with these two distributors. They said, listen, we have some really bad news. haagen ice cream, which had just been bought by the Pillsbury Corporation, had come to them and told them that if they continued to carry Ben and Jerry's on their trucks, they weren't going to sell them haagen anymore. And as these distributors told us, look, we like you guys, we like your ice cream, but haagen is the most profitable item we carry on our trucks. We, we can't afford to be without it. So we're going to have to drop your product. So they told us this, and Ben started laughing. He just thought this was hilarious. Uh, they said, Ben, uh, this is really serious. <laughs> Why are you laughing? 
And Ben said, I can't believe that haagen and Pillsbury is worried about little old Ben and Jerry's in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, but they were, and it, it was a real problem. First of all, it seemed like what they were doing was illegal, that it's a restraint of trade under federal antitrust laws. That says a company that controls the major part of a market can't use its power and position to keep competitors out. So we thought, okay, we'll sue Pillsbury. That'll be fun. Uh, <laughs> Uh, at the time, they were a $4 billion company. Uh, then we thought we could file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission. But everybody we talked to told us that the Federal Trade Commission was much more interested in helping big companies get bigger as opposed to helping small companies survive. So we thought, well, if we're going to go down, we'll at least take our case to the people. And so we started the What's the Doughboy Afraid Of campaign. <laughs> so this was kicked off by me going to Minneapolis to the Pillsbury World Headquarters where I was a one-person picket line. <laughs> I had my little picket sign. It said, What's the Doughboy Afraid Of? And I was walking up and down on the sidewalk in front of the Pillsbury Headquarters, handing out leaflets to people, and nobody had any idea why I was there. Uh, then we took out a small classified ad in the back of Rolling Stone magazine, said, help two Vermont hippies fight the corporate giants. Uh, then we started flying aerial banners around the sports stadiums in Boston that said, what's the doughboy afraid of? Uh, we took out signs on the sides of the transit buses in Boston that had these two pudgy white hands coming out from behind the sign, squeezing a pint of Ben and Jerry's, said, don't let Pillsbury's dollars strangle Ben and Jerry's. Uh, we decided, you know, at the end, we're just going to go straight to our customers. So Ben and I recorded a phone message explaining the situation uh, and asking people if they were interested to leave their name and address to receive a Doughboy mail-in kit. And uh, in conjunction with this, we printed on all our pint containers an 800 number, so they would be connected. And the Doughboy mail-in kit, uh, it consisted of this original brochure I had been handing out. Uh, there was a letter to the Federal Trade Commission. There was a letter to the chairman of the board of Pillsbury, which essentially said, why don't you guys pick on someone your own size? Uh, there was a bumper sticker, this evil-looking bumper sticker that said, what's the Doughboy afraid of? There was a t-shirt offer. You could purchase a t-shirt. Uh, on the front, it said, what's the Doughboy afraid of? On the back, it said, Ben and Jerry's Legal Defense Fund, major contributor. Uh, <laughs> they cost $10. So. We recorded this phone message. We hooked it up to these answering machines at work, which were then connected to this 800 number on all the pint containers. And we started getting all these phone calls. We get, started getting several hundred phone calls a week, mostly between the hours of midnight and 3 a.m. <laughs> uh, oh, and the story got picked up in the media. There was an article about it in the Wall Street Journal. There was a big article about it in the New Yorker magazine. There was a cover story on the Sunday magazine section of the Boston Globe newspaper. Because there was so much of a public outcry, Pillsbury and haagen backed down. They allowed these distributors to carry Ben & Jerry's on their trucks, right next to all the other brands that they carried. And that's what permitted Ben & Jerry's to eventually be distributed across the country. Ah! <laughs> so, you know, it, it was right after this time, Ben and I looked at each other one day and said, boy, what the heck is going on here? Uh, we're not ice cream guys anymore. We're becoming businessmen. We're not spending our time making ice cream and scooping it over the counter to our customers. We're spending our time 
hiring people and firing people and writing memos and correspondence and talking with lawyers and accountants. Uh, it was not exactly our idea of a good time. Plus, we had grown up in the 60s. You guys have studied about the 60s, right? <laughs> Peace and love, that whole thing. Well, you know, that was Ben and me. And uh, we felt like, uh, you know, we, di we didn't have a very good feeling about business. Uh, and we felt like our business was just becoming another cog in the economic machine. And, and we didn't really want any part of that. So we decided to get out. And uh, just then, Ben ran into this friend of his, uh, Maurice Purpura. Maurice was this oh, slightly older, slightly eccentric restaurateur from down in southern Vermont. And Ben was telling Maurice we were going to get out of the business. Maurice said, Ben, how could you do that? The business is your baby. It's, it's just starting to take off. And Ben said, well, Maurice, you know what business does. It takes advantage of its employees. It spoils the environment. It exploits the community. And Maurice said, well, Ben, if there's something you don't like about the way business is done, why don't you just change it? And as Ben says, that had never really occurred to him before. <laughs> so at that point, we decided to stay with the business and see if we could make it something that we were really proud of, something that was supportive of the community, supportive of employees. Uh, and at that time, oh boy, Ben & Jerry's was doing probably about $2 million in sales. We were, we were making ice cream uh, in this rented facility, a 3,000 square foot rented facility with World War II vintage ice cream making equipment. Uh, we couldn't meet our orders. We didn't have room for our ingredients or our finished goods. We were really bursting at the seams, and we were at the stage of a business where it needs to take in some more money to get to the next level. And the normal thing for a business to do at that point would be to take in venture capital, uh, money from a, a small number of well-to-do investors who invest in the business in the hopes that the business will prosper and uh, they'll make a good return on that. And what Ben and I decided to do was to use this need for cash as an opportunity to make the community owners of the business so that as the business prospered, the community as owners would automatically prosper and not be dependent upon the business's kindness or generosity. And the way we found to do this was to hold what became the first ever in-state Vermont public stock offering, selling stock in the company to Vermonters, people who had been supporting the business since it began. Uh, as I mentioned, this had never been done before. Ben unearthed this obscure law in Vermont that said you could do this. So, you know, we went and talked to all our business advisors. They said, this is a terrible idea. Uh, first of all, it's never been done before. That's reason enough not to do it. Uh, you should take the money from the venture capitalists because when you need more, there'll be more where that came from. Also, there's not very many people in Vermont. There's, there's only 640,000 people in the entire state. And, uh, you know, it's not a particularly wealthy state. Uh, so they all said, this is bad. And we said, well, we don't really care. If we're going to grow our business, we want to do it in a way that's consistent with our values. So uh, we couldn't find anybody to underwrite the offering. The company underwrote it itself. Ben and I registered as stockbrokers, if you can believe that. Uh, <laughs> and we had a very low minimum purchase of $126 so that people of essentially any economic situation could participate. Normally, uh, public offerings are reserved for so-called sophisticated investors that have several thousand dollars. But that's not who we were looking for. We were looking for our neighbors, the people who had been supporting the business since it began. Uh, 
So we did road shows around the state. We advertised it in the first section of the newspaper, right next to the clothing ads and the supermarket ads. Said, get a scoop of the action. Uh, and uh, at the end of the offering, which we sold out, we raised $750,000. One out of every 100 families in Vermont had become owners in Ben & Jerry's. So we were very excited, continued to operate the company. About a year and a half later, we needed more money. <laughs> uh, at that time, we decided to have a national public offering. And in conjunction with that, we established the Ben & Jerry's Foundation as the charitable arm of the company. And the foundation would receive 7.5% of the company's pre-tax profits, which was the highest percentage of any publicly held company. The corporate average is around 1.5%. And the reason we chose such a high percentage was that our feeling at the time was that a business is essentially a machine for making money, so that if we wanted to be as of much benefit to the community as possible, we should give away as much money as possible. So we had the public offering, uh, we set up the foundation, the company started funding the foundation, and in no time at all, the foundation was overwhelmed with grant requests from nonprofit organizations doing incredibly worthwhile work. Issues like hunger, housing, what have you. And and the foundation could fund only a, a minuscule percentage of the requests that were coming in. And as we thought about it, we realized that all the foundations in the country are in the same situation. There are these tremendous unmet human needs and not nearly enough money to go around. And, you know, we started to wonder, as a business, what, what more could we do? And so we started off by thinking about business and the definition of business. Now, you guys here in the business school know that uh, the normal definition of business is that business is an entity that produces a product or provides a service. Well, at Ben & Jerry's, we started to define it differently. We said that business is a combination of organized human energy plus money, which equals power. In fact, it's become clear that business is now the most powerful force in our society. And it's a relatively new phenomenon. It didn't always used to be that way. It's, it's something that's probably taken place within my own lifetime. Uh, you know, looking back historically, Originally, the most powerful force was religion. And then it came to be governments, nation states. And now it's business. And you can see that reality echoed in the buildings in the major cities around the world. The oldest big ornate buildings are religious buildings. The second oldest big ornate buildings are governmental buildings. And today, <laughs> the huge buildings being built are commercial buildings. And as this most powerful force, business has an incredible influence on our society, ranging from influence on elections through campaign contributions. And as you may know, there are now no limits as to how much corporations or wealthy individuals can make to campaigns. Uh, business has a huge impact on legislation through lobbying. Business controls all the mainstream media through ownership. And business has a huge impact on, on how we're all treated, both as consumers and as employees. And <laughs> the interesting thing about all this influence that business has is that it uses it in its own self-interest, which is to make money. Uh, and that's the big difference with business as this most powerful force and with religion and government. Because religion and government have always had as part of their purpose 
looking out for the common good. But that has never been the purpose of business. I mean, it's not that business is negative or evil or weird. Uh, I mean, look at me. I'm a business guy. I'm a cool guy. Uh, you know, it's just that business <laughs> tends to operate in its own self-interest. I mean, face it, that's what corporations do. Well, what we started to learn at Ben & Jerry's is that there's a spiritual aspect to business, just as there is to the lives of individuals. As you give, you receive. As you help others, you are helped in return. We're all interconnected. You know, this is a spiritual law. I think most of us believe as people that there's some spiritual part to us. For some reason, when we gather together in a group and call ourselves a business, we throw that idea out the window. Well, you know, Ben and I uh, talk to business groups occasionally, and, and as you might imagine, this idea of spirituality in business, uh, you know, it's not your normal business rap. And uh, even though it's a return to very traditional values, it still meets with incredible resistance. Uh, Schopenhauer, the philosopher, said that all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. So we are, we are somewhere along that journey. Uh, several years ago, Ben and I got invited to go to a CEO weekend workshop at Emory University in Atlanta. And there were CEOs there from some of the biggest, most successful companies. There was the CEO there from Home Depot, from UPS. Ben and I were not exactly sure why we were invited. Maybe they thought we would bring dessert, which we did. Uh, but we were there. And after a weekend that we spent with these, you know, very successful business people, what we learned is that these are good people and they have strong social values, they care about people, uh, they contribute their own time and their own money to issues they believe in. And so the question arose to us, well, if business is this most powerful force, and the people running these businesses are these good, caring people. Why isn't business doing more to help the growing social and environmental problems in our country? And the reason we came to understand is that you only get what you measure. And in business, what we measure is profitability. How much money have we made? How much money is left over? And that's what we look at every quarter, every year, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's what everybody on the, in the business focuses on. Uh, and it's really this, this double-edged sword. On the one hand, it keeps everybody in the business focused and aligned and working together for a common goal. But on the other hand, it put blinders on all of us so that we don't look at the impacts, the social impacts, the environmental impacts uh, of all these activities that businesses undertake in this single-minded pursuit of profit. I mean, you know, measuring, it's like, uh, <laughs> it's like if you're on a diet, you know, you're trying to lose some weight, so, you know, you watch what you eat, uh, you see how your clothes fit, uh, you see if you're getting exercise, you weigh yourself occasionally, and if you're doing well, you continue what you're doing. And if you're not doing well, you try to change your behavior to achieve what you're trying to measure towards. And in business, it's the same thing. It's just about money. Well, so we said, boy, if the problem is how we measure our success, why don't we just change that? And so that's what we did. We decided to redefine the bottom line, to have a two-part bottom line, so that we would now measure our success, not just in how much money we made, but how much are we able to improve the quality of life in the communities where we operate? So 
We called an all-company meeting. It was in a room a lot smaller than this, and Ben and I were up there in the front just like now, and we said, okay, from now on, we're gonna have a two-part bottom line. We're not just gonna make money, we're gonna see how we improve communities. And everybody stood up and cheered. It was a very popular idea, people loved it. And then we all went back to work. And uh, a few weeks later, some of our managers came to us and they said, we've got a problem. We said, oh, they said, yeah. <laughs> that two-part bottom line, it sounded great, but we find that when we take company energy and resources to give back to the community, it takes away from our ability to make money and vice versa. And we said, huh, <laughs> that is a problem. <laughs> and we thought about it. Uh, we realized that the solution to that dilemma is to choose those courses of action that have a positive impact on both of those bottom lines, making money, giving back. And, you know, when, when we first thought of it, uh, when people hear it, I mean, when you first hear it, you know, at first it sounds all nice and warm and fuzzy, and then you think about it some more and you think, well, you can't really do that. And the reason we all think that is because that's the way we've been programmed to think, conditioned to think. Uh, you know, we think if you want to make some money, you do it over here with the business, you want to do some good, do it over here, you can't possibly combine the two. But what we've learned is that it's really just a mindset and that if you get rid of that mindset and, and think more broadly, the opportunities to address both of those bottom lines uh, are essentially limitless. And I'll give some examples of how Ben & Jerry's has been trying to do this. You know, I, I think it's helpful <laughs> to know that when we first started trying to do it, we had no idea what we were doing. And as with any thing that you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you know, you come up with some ideas, you try it, you see how they work or don't work. Uh, when it doesn't work, you try to make some improvements and then you try again. And it, it's just like any other process of innovation. I mean, it's like new flavors at Ben & Jerry's. You know, most new flavors don't make it. They never get out of the lab. They never see the light of day. Uh, you know, you guys know the expression, many are called, few are chosen. At Ben & Jerry's, we have many are cold, few are frozen. <laughs> uh, so, so it's the field in which we labor. And the way we approached it was, uh, we said, how can we look at the normal day-to-day -day business activities that the company engages in and try to integrate social and environmental concerns right into those day-to-day -day activities. So they're, they're not ancillary to what the company does, but they're central to what the company does. So we said, okay, we're an ice cream company. Uh, we do need to make new flavors. Uh, we became aware of a bakery outside of New York City in Yonkers, the, the Grayston Bakery, and the purpose of this bakery is to work with people who are out of the economic mainstream, people that have had problems with substance abuse, legal problems. And so we said, boy, I wonder if this bakery makes any good baked goods we can put in ice cream. And we learned they made some really good brownies. So Ben & Jerry's came up with a flavor called chocolate fudge brownie. It uses brownies from Grayston Bakery. Uh, the flavor is a delicious flavor, very profitable for Ben & Jerry's. And simply by purchasing those brownies, we support the work that Grayston does. Ben & Jerry's now uses those brownies and chocolate fudge brownie ice cream, yogurt, half-baked, any number of ways. And I think last year Ben & Jerry's bought over $8 million worth of brownies from Grayston. Uh, another thing as an ice cream company we need to do is to sell ice cream. Ben & Jerry's has about 250 franchised ice cream shops, one right here in RIT. Uh, and uh, 14 of those shops are what we call partner shops. They're shops that are owned and operated by nonprofit social service agencies who work with at-risk youth. They provide 
job training and job experience. Uh, so any money that those uh, partnerships make goes back to funding their programs, and in addition, they provide jobs and job training uh, for these young people. Uh, ben and Jerry's is also now transitioning to 100% fair trade ingredients. By the end of this year, it'll be 100% fair traded. Uh, fair trade is a program whereby farmers, small farmers in developing countries get guaranteed a fair price for their products like cocoa or coffee and vanilla. Uh, often the market price is below uh, their cost of production and fair trade uses a third party certifier who determines what a fair price for them is. And in addition to that, they get paid a small social premium that they're able to invest back in their communities in, in things like uh, health care clinics or fixing up roads, schools, whatever they decide to do. So those are a couple of examples. Uh, you know, it's really interesting and ironic that several years ago, Ben and Jerry started to get criticized in the media that we were cynically trying to manipulate our customers into buying more ice cream by doing good deeds. <laughs> uh, and our response is that our actions are based on deeply held values. And in addition, we understand that true marketing is an integrated and holistic attempt to meet another set of our customers' needs. Our customers' needs to have business be addressing the growing social and environmental problems. Uh, this way of doing business provides all these benefits to the company. I mean, all these things you read about in marketing books and business textbooks, it provides added value. It's a unique selling proposition. Uh, it helps with recruiting, it helps with retaining employees, and best of all, it helps with customers. Uh, what we've been learning at Ben & Jerry's is that there is a spiritual aspect to business, just as there is to the lives of individuals. As you give, you receive. As you help others, you are helped in return. And just because the idea that the good that you do comes back to you is written in the Bible and not in some business textbook doesn't mean that it's any less valid. We're all interconnected, and as we help others, we can't help to help ourselves. For business and people, it's all the same. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So we, we have opportunities for questions, I believe, and we have our green-clad volunteers with microphones, and maybe they're going to find people that have questions. Look, they're shaking their heads yes. Uh, hop to it. Hi. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. Right oh, there. there you are. Hi. I was just wondering how your um, philosophy of doing business has worked with Unilever. So, so, so the question is, uh, how are things working with Unilever since the company got acquired? Uh, generally good. Uh, I think if you had asked me six or eight years ago, I would have said generally bad. Uh, but. We have a great CEO with the company now, and the person leading Unilever is really good. You know, Ben, ben and Jerry's has a unique uh, agreement with Unilever. So when the company got acquired, uh, this agreement uh, set in place an independent board of directors for Ben and Jerry's. That's, Unilever has one seat on, but the rest is independent. And the board is responsible for overseeing the social mission of the company, and what's known as the essential integrity of the brand. And Unilever is responsible for the operations, 
uh, and you know probably the finances of the company. And so, so long as everybody at the company wants to play by those rules, it all goes really well. And when there are people involved who don't really believe in what's written on those pieces of paper, it's more of a struggle. But the, the people running things now are great. You know, I'll give an example. Uh, I just came back from a week in Oregon. So in the state of Oregon, this, this election year, there's a ballot initiative uh, about mandatory labeling of GMOs in food. And uh, Ben and & Jerry's is supporting that. Ben & Jerry's is supporting transparency and labeling and a consumer's right to know. Ah! Uh, and uh, I guess I'm not exactly sure Unilever's position on that particular issue, but it's not the same as Ben & Jerry's. Uh, you know, I think you know, it's not fair for me to say what they're looking for. I do know they're much more interested in, in a national framework and, and not in some state-by-state -state solution. Uh, but they understand that Ben & Jerry's has the right to do that, and, uh, and they support Ben & Jerry's right to do that, and I give them a lot of credit for that. Hi. Hello. Oh, two comments. Do you remember that program... Um let's make a deal, and people would, you know, find things in their purses and stuff like that. Well, if you open up all the dorm rooms and, and apartments in RIT, my son has brought his ice cream maker and his Ben and Jerry's ice cream book to RIT and found that a big um, uh, icebreaker for making friends and stuff. So he's going to bring his book over to be signed. <laughs> that sounds great. And, I'd um, love to. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, products and um, having them, what is it, uh, having them come from all the places. I was wondering, uh, chocolate and Ivory Coast and Ebola, comments? So uh, the question <laughs> is about chocolate and Ebola? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So what, I, I understand that most of the chocolate yes. in this world comes from countries that are now, uh, have outbreaks of Ebola, and uh, I'm just not up on that. I, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I, you know, I haven't heard anything at the company that there's going to be a shortage of, of chocolate or that it's unsafe in any way to eat. Uh, thank you. You got a question right here? All right. Hi. Hi. Getting loud. Um, First, I just want to say thank you very much for creating such a fantastic brand of ice cream. There's nothing that cures the winter blues quite like a pint of Ben and & Jerry's. <laughs> and everyone here at RIT understands what I'm talking about. So, you know you're not supposed to eat a pint of Ben & Jerry's, right? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> My question is about... Um, the process that you guys went through when you were coming up with some of your more unique flavors. Um, could you go into the thought process or what you guys went through for some of your more popular brands? So like Cherry Garcia? Uh-huh. So, uh, Cherry, well this is interesting. So, Cherry Garcia, Chunky Monkey, and Chubby Hubby were all customer suggestions. And they all start with cha but they're from different customers, and I don't know why that is. Uh, so Cherry Garcia, which is still the most popular flavor at Ben & Jerry's, uh, came about because the company received an anonymous postcard from a couple of people who said, uh, we're big Ben & Jerry's fans, and we're also big Grateful Dead fans, and we think you ought to make a flavor called Cherry Garcia because it would be a real hoot for the fans plus dead paraphernalia always sells. <laughs> it's true, right? I mean, yeah. uh, Jay, we've got a question way up here in the back. Hi. How's hey. Going? <laughs> so I have a, my, my favorite flavor is chocolate therapy, and I'm just curious, what's your favorite flavor of Ben & Jerry's ice cream? It's very good. Uh, so my favorite flavor is uh, Americone Dream, 
vanilla ice cream, a caramel swirl, fudge-covered pieces of waffle cones. Uh, it's really good. Um, so, you know, Ben and I eat plenty of ice cream. So this is a great thing. Ben and I are members of one of the most exclusive clubs in the world. It is the Ben and Jerry's Free Ice Cream for Life Club. Uh, and you know, you get in that club by doing something extraordinary, but what's different about Ben's and my membership is that upon our unfortunate demise, we are able to pass that membership on to one person. And uh, so we, we both have children who I think are really sucking up to us with uh, <laughs> Hi. Um, altruism, I think, is important. Uh, it's, it's the nature of professionalism for doctors and lawyers and clergy. And so, um, obviously, that's, that's something that's important to you. Um, I've read that Warren Buffett is the person who convinced Bill Gates that he ought to give away money now. And so I'm wondering how you have or how you will be the sort of Warren Buffett to convince other corporations that some element of altruism or social responsibility is an appropriate way for businesses to operate. Uh-huh. You know, uh, I don't usually try to go out and convince anybody of anything. That's, uh, I think, because I'm not really that good at it. But I, I think, uh, you know, I think what Ben and I like to share is that, uh, you know, there's this conventional thinking in business that if you're a caring company, if you're uh, a generous business, you won't be as financially successful as other businesses. And our experience is exactly the opposite of that. Uh, the more caring Ben & Jerry's has been, the more successful it's been. And it's, it's certainly not the only way to do business, but if you are a person or a business that wants to factor those things into your company, you can do that and be as successful as anyone else. Jay, we've got a question to your right, over here, all the way to the wall. Oh, hi, thank you. Hi there, I'm gonna ask you a question as a contemporary of yours. I grew up in the same sort of uh, social era that you did, and everything that you say uh, rings very true to me and my husband, and we sort of fell into our careers and, and have been very successful at the things that we've done, much as you were describing. However, that's not today's climate, that's not today's environment, and we have a whole bunch of students now who are studying the textbook method of doing business, which in many cases is pretty much at odds with what you're describing, and they're not finding the economic environment where they can sort of stumble their way into a successful business. How would you square for them a balance between what you were successful at in the way that you did things and what they're learning now and how to navigate today's business environment. Uh huh. You know, I, I only have limited experience uh, coming in contact with business students and young people, but my impression is that uh, young people today, millennials, are really concerned with social issues and are really concerned with having businesses uh, be caring about more than, than simply how much money they make. There's, there's been a proliferation of uh, business organizations with socially responsible businesses. There's a new type of corporation called a B Corporation which has come into being which has been amazingly successful. B Corps are, it stands for a benefit corporation where uh, some of the stated uh, mission of the company is to provide public benefit, and they, they are growing like wildfire. So I guess, uh, you know, the, the idea that uh, the only purpose of business is to maximize profit, which, you know, is kind of the old classical definition. I mean, it's not to make profit, it's to maximize profit. Squeeze out as much as you can. I don't, I don't think that really plays with uh, younger people growing up today. It's just one person's opinion. Hi. 
Hey. Uh, I applaud your business model, and you just touched on a great deal of what I was going to ask about, the B Corporation, because historically, shareholders have been able to sue the corporation for not maximizing profits. The way in which you selected your shareholders, giving them a vested interest in the, the public good, uh, is a great way to finesse that. And these B Corporations uh, will, uh, in, in, in a court situation where they are sued for not maximizing profits, the B Corporation will have built into their charter that uh, social good is a corporate goal. And so that will defeat the, uh, the profit-seeking um, people suing. And what I'm wondering was uh, whether, uh, and, and all of this uh, has happened since 2001 when the company was sold, New York State adopted its law only about three years ago. And I was wondering how much uh, inspiration your business model as exemplified by the Ben & Jerry's Corporation was an inspiration for this, whether you've been involved in uh, proselytizing for this kind of law, um, uh, beyond simply uh, the, the inspiration for mm -hmm. it. Uh, thank you. So th the question is about B Corps. Uh, you know, Ben & Jerry's was uh, one of a handful of companies back when we started that that were in the vanguard of, of looking at how to use the power of business. And there were other ones still today, Patagonia, The Body Shop, Stonyfield Farm Yogurt. Uh, and so for those of you who don't know, B Corp, as, as was mentioned, is this new type of corporation that has been chartered in, I don't know, 15 states or so, and, and it's increasing every year. And it's a, it's a type of corporation that corporations can voluntarily choose to become a B Corp. So it's not mandatory, but you can make it, as, as was said, part of your charter. Uh, you know, I'm certainly in touch with the folks at B Corp, but they have just done an astounding job uh, in terms of, <laughs> I mean, everything, the way they've organized things. Uh, they, they sort of cover the areas of organization and charters, they cover the area of, uh, uh, what's the word, you know, seeing how you do, measuring, and uh, so they cover it all and they're just incredibly effective and I, I could only hope that I had some tiny effect on them because these guys are great. They are the real deal. Got a question up here in the back. Well, I'm by saying that I'm employed at uh, two separate Ben & Jerry's right now, so <laughs> thanks for the job. <laughs> Both of them. Um, I was wondering if there was any flavors that you would have hand in that ended up being in the graveyard, and as well, are there any in the graveyard right now that you're, you're disappointed about? Like, you, you would like to see it on the shelves, but nobody likes it. Flavors from the grave. So you guys familiar with the Ben & Jerry's flavor graveyard? They're, they're actually... Uh, so the Flavor Graveyard contains all the flavors of Ben and Jerry's that have moved on to the afterlife. Uh, uh, so there's the Ben and Jerry's Virtual Flavor Graveyard, which is online, where you can go online and pay your respects to your favorite dearly departed flavor. <laughs> and then at, at the Ben and Jerry's uh, factory tour in Waterbury, Vermont, there's, there's an actual flavor graveyard with gravestones and flavors dug in. And so, and you may be curious, how do flavors get to the flavor graveyard? Well, people don't buy enough of a flavor and it goes into the graveyard and even some of my favorite flavors are in the flavor graveyard. Uh, coconut almond fudge chip was, oh, listen to that, huh? Huh? <laughs> So here's a very interesting thing about flavors. If you really like a flavor, like I really like coconut almond fudge chip, you can't imagine that not everybody loves the flavor and it's the most beloved flavor in the world, but it turns out it's not. And coconut, coconut is a very polarizing flavor, I'll have you know. You know, people love it or they hate it and not enough people love it. Hi. Um Hi. I wanted to ask you, when you became a national public company, you have to look up for your stakeholders' interests. So when you changed the philosophy to be more um, 
proactive for the community instead of being so much focused on profit and revenue for the stakeholders? How did you manage that change with the stakeholders? So the, the question is, uh, how did we manage uh, our shareholders when uh, we thought about things beyond profit? And so Ben and Jerry started in 1978. Uh, in 1988, 10 years later, we wrote a mission statement. And the mission statement for Ben and Jerry's, which is still in force today, is a three-part mission. So it talks about a product mission, making an incredibly delicious whatever, uh, an economic mission to provide a reasonable return for all our stakeholders, and a social mission to proactively use the power of business to uh, address social and environmental concerns. So it, it's, it's part of what the company has been. Uh, and the, by and large, the shareholders have always supported that. Uh, I think every once in a while, if you take a very, very short-term view, which happens on Wall Street a lot when you're looking at quarterly results, uh, you know, what, what happens in one quarter for a business may not be what's in the best long-term interests of the shareholders, but it's, it's very hard in our current market, public market system to get that across to people. So it's, it's an ongoing challenge. We've got a question in your upper right-hand corner. Hi, um, I'm an alumnus of RIT. I yeah! Uh, we love RIT, yes. right? Yeah! Uh, I, I did the corporate thing for a while, and then I went rogue. I became an entrepreneur. And I've built several successful businesses. I can tie into you where you say about being interrelated. Uh, and I have found uh, within, a cor within developing a business that your value system and your culture that you're building in that business becomes extremely important, where you'll hear quite often it's the investor first, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what I have found, I'd be interesting if you found the same thing, I think you did. Uh, take care of your employees and your customers and your investors will do way better than the traditional model, take care of the investors first, is what I have found. Uh, we also did, uh, very similarly, um, like you did, we looked for a fair return. And then what was in excess we were able to make better lives for our employees and outside things we were interested in. So th that was a good thing. I'm also curious is within Ben and Jerry's when you owned it, did all the employees have stock? And then how the hell did you ever take the culture of a Ben and Jerry's interrelatedness and all this into the culture of Unilever, because I've been in big corporations, it had to be one hell of a thunderstorm. I mean. How did that go? <laughs> that so there was a lot there, right? I mean, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, let me just take the last part about Ben and Jerry's and Unilever, because people are just really curious about it. And I, I understand if I were sitting in the audience, that's what I would be curious about. How does this thing work? So Unilever is a $50 billion company. Uh, they're global, and uh, they, they run most of their products as brands. So they're not separate companies within divisions of Unilever, they're just operated as brands. Uh, and Ben and & Jerry's is different in that it's, I guess I would describe it as a semi-autonomous company. Uh, ben & Jerry's has headquarters in Vermont, uh, at that headquarters, the company works on new product development, does the marketing, uh, it does uh, retail operations, the stores, and then Unilever handles sales, distribution, uh, finances. So generally it's split up like that. And uh, I would say the values of the two companies are not that different. Unilever has a very, very strong commitment to sustainability and uh, I guess what we would call a, a real environmental ethic. 
Ben & Jerry's has much more of a uh, uh, social justice lens that it looks looks through things. So there's not really that much of a of a clash in terms of values. There's there's much more of a difference in terms of culture, as you mentioned. Ben and Jerry's culture uh, <laughs> was built very much on who Ben and I are, uh, and Ben particularly because he's. Uh, Ben is just a very colorful personality. Uh, th there's Patrick Papino who knows Ben really, really well. Uh, you know, so the, the whole idea of Ben and Jerry's being anti-corporate, irreverent, anti-authoritarian, and yet also playful and whimsical, all comes from Ben. Uh, and you know, that, that's, those are very hard things to have them be authentic in a large corporation. That, that just doesn't happen. And it happens if you have a very uh, <laughs> powerful, strong personality like Ben. I mean, are we running out of time? Yeah, we're running out of time. I'm gonna tell you one story. Uh, I don't know if I should, I'm gonna do it anyway. So uh, <laughs> just take this for what it is. So, you know, a real pivotal time at Ben and Jerry's in terms of the social mission and defining who we were was uh, during the 90s when Ben and Jerry's was going to come out with a chocolate covered ice cream bar on a stick and we were going to call it a peace pop. This was during the height of the Cold War uh, and instead of using the packaging to talk about what a delicious and luxurious product this was, uh, we were going to use the packaging to talk about uh, peace through understanding activities between the U.S. and the Soviet Union and redirecting 1% of the military budget to peace through understanding activities. So this was uh, just a, a huge controversy within Ben & Jerry's. Uh, the company had never taken any sort of stand on any sort of political issue uh, and it was just a real fight. People were saying it's not appropriate for a business to be taking a position on what is essentially a government program. We're going to be seen as unpatriotic. Uh, customers are going to boycott our products in supermarkets, what have you. And uh, as I always say to his enormous credit, Ben shoved it down the company's throat. Uh, <laughs> and it was great because people finally said, okay, this is who we are, and these are what our values are, and you either agree with it and you move on, or you find another place to be, but that's who we were, and none of those bad things ever happened. Uh, and people who, who, even people who didn't agree with the company's position respected that it would take a stand on an issue that was not in its own economic self-interest. I mean, businesses are always taking stands on issues like uh, lessening environmental regulation or not raising the minimum wage. And here was a company saying, we're looking out for what the common good is. And uh, so it, it, it was really this pivotal moment. Uh, and, you know, it's just, you know, Ben always says, <laughs> you're never going to get 100% market share. And, it's better to have people who share your values and feel like you're all working to bring about the same kind of world. People in the company are not just working for a paycheck, they're working to share those values. Customers who are buying the ice cream are not just buying the ice cream. We're all working together to bring about this other kind of world and that's much deeper than a cute marketing campaign. All right, well, let's go eat ice cream. What do you say? Thank you.